Hello, everybody. Welcome to Northshire Prevent Presents. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager of Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. I'm also representing my friends and colleagues from Northshire Bookstore, uh, flagship store in Manchester, Vermont. Um, a couple of quick notes before we get started this evening. Um, first of all, you may notice as you're coming in that this evening's presentation is being recorded for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel. However, fear not. We have the settings arranged so that only those of us who are unmuted and speaking will be recorded. Um, so you will not be recorded for posterity. You will not show up on YouTube. Um, and you can have your video on if you wish to. Um, however, to stay muted, please do use the chat function to ask any questions that you have this evening. I will save them up. We'll have time for audience questions at the end of the presentation, and I will ask your questions for you then. Please send your questions at any point along the way, whenever you wish. Um, also, before I introduce our special guest this evening, note of thanks. Um, it's been a long, strange, weird year and a half now for um, really independent businesses of all stripes. Um, I know it's been hard in the bookselling world. I think it's been hard in the music shop world. Um, it's been hard for everybody and local businesses really couldn't keep doing what we're doing without the incredible loyalty and support of our customers. Um, and I know that we've been incredibly grateful. Um, for your ongoing support in this last year and a half. We truly couldn't do events like this one without your help. So thank you for that. Um, and now I am so excited to get to be the one to welcome Billy Cole to Northshire Presents to talk about his wonderful memoir with the band. Billy is the proprietor of Cole's Woodwind Shop just around the corner from Northshire and the founder of Horns for Haiti, a not-for-profit organization that provides instruments and, instru and instruction and instrument repair for remote regions of Haiti. He's going to be interviewed tonight um, and is lucky them actually in person with tonight, um, musician and radio host Rob Smittix. You can hear on his weekly radio program every Sunday from 6 to 9 p.m. on Radio Radio X and in the band Smittix. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Presents. <laughs> Bill, Bill Cole, how's it going? Great, Rob. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, this is why we're here, this book right here, with the band. Now, I apologize for having to sit so close to you, Bill, but, uh, you know, it is a lovely couch that we're on. It's a comfortable couch. Yeah. It is a comfortable couch. Uh, we're doing the interview from the comfortable couch right here at the Radio Radio X dot com studios. And um, anyway, this book that Bill has written is phenomenal. Now, it's funny because I actually have two copies. You see this copy right here? So that one's a little bit more worn out than the one I have. I have read the book, but I, I like to keep my books nice and neat. This one has been through a few hands. If you open it up, read who you signed that to. Oh, to Quinn and Cantera. Quinn and Cantera. <laughs> Well, that's not our outfit. Yeah, that, that's kind of around, gotten around a little bit. <laughs> yes, it has. So Quentin Cantera, big time radio hosts um, who have decided, you know, once they read it, they spread this book around. This is my boss's copy of the book. Uh, so this book is going around. We love it. All right, great. Um, so, I mean, did you realize that you were writing these memoirs when you started to actually become this beautiful book that it is? I started writing, writing my memoir um, really for my family's sake. Uh, although I've had many, many um, encouraging reasons to start, start the book. First of all, I'd love to tell stories verbally and people would, would say you should write a book, yeah, the, the obvious, but um. Back in the late 90s, I came across my great grandfather's um, handwritten um, diary with his month long voyage from Bristol, England to Montreal and thus thence to, to Albany, New York by steamship. And to hold a piece of paper in my hand that my great great grandfather had and, and wrote and, and, and to listen to his words of uh, his experiences of that voyage every day what the seas were like, what, what passage from the Bible he read from was so cool and so powerful. I knew that someday I wanted to do it for my great, great grandson, mm -hmm. never mind my, my children and my grandchildren, you know? So that, I think that was my number one inspiration. No, absolutely. That's profound. I mean, to think about your family reading this book 
after you're gone, which hopefully is many, many decades and decades from now. But um, yeah, that's, that's something to really think about, something that you've left behind. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you got a million stories in there and you've already talked about family already. In the book, so much. I mean, you dedicated the, the book to your wife. So much is revolved around your family, but also your woodwind store in Saratoga. That's right. And um, it, it always went hand in hand. Remember my wife, I mean, I, I've known her since she's 15, 15 years old. She was the one who encouraged me to go to school for band instrument repair, mm. um, along with my music teacher. But what Mary Alice has been my constant all these years through um, the start of the business, um, my rejections and my victories, uh, raising our children together, you know, it's, it's huge. And of course, she's, she is my partner in all of this, for if, sure. If my wife is listening, you hear that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, they mentioned that I'm in a band. I can't even get her to run the merch table. <laughs> but no, that's very nice to have such a supportive uh, spouse. But also, I mean, you got your kids involved in the, the store and everything as well, right? That's right. My, my children have always been involved in one way or the other, if not on the bench. Um, uh, like Jennifer, my, my oldest, uh, runs my social media for, for the most part. Uh, my son works with me side by side every day for for many years yeah. now and um and it's, it's very cool working with him it's, it's a very special thing it is i've i i know who you i know your son um he had some really cool like music projects uh going on uh a while back is he doing anything with that right now he is not he's he's on hiatus of uh, being, being a drummer right now but um we had we had just moved our home and we have um some new space in the basement he is going to take over so he says for a music studio get his drums up and running again and i would love to see him get back into the music scene because he really is an awesome drummer now with that being the case i mean because being a, a woodwind shop and you're obviously working with brass and you know just those types of instruments you know obviously we've got some really cool rock and roll bands here but i mean i know some of the music I, i've heard that your son did did you ever say, wow, you know, this is kind of like, you know, a generation uh, gap here? Or did you did you relate to it? I could relate to it. I was in awe of um, watching Billy play, um, playing out. He had, There's an energy that um, is not there when he's home. Of course, he's, he's very good home practicing. But when, whenever you're playing with your bandmates and you're and you're making it happen, it's, it's a whole, whole different scene for sure. Now you had a shop in Water Valley, New York, before the Saratoga Springs. Explain a little bit about you know how you started, you know the business, but also what made you move to uh, the Saratoga area and how that benefited you as a business owner. I always had different uh, reasons for moving. I probably I think I had four or five shops, lo locations. Oh, okay. But, but my reason for moving to Saratoga Springs is because I've gone through a business experiment, if you will. I, I, my shop got bigger and bigger. I had six employees. I was marketing schools. And um, I found myself more doing business than um, repairing instruments, and I hated it. Um, my wife saw that in me, and, um, and I mean, perhaps she just got sick of it listening to me um, complain. But one day she said, let's get in the car. Let's go up to Saratoga Springs. Let's just go up there right now. And this story is in the book, how this all unfolded. But it, it is true. We jumped in the car, went up to Saratoga Springs, found a shop, drove up next to it. And um, as Big would have it, that mm -hmm. would be my shop for, for, for several years until I found the Phyla Street uh, shop underneath Cafe Lena. And Phyla Street, yeah. I mean, that is, to me, that's the street in Saratoga. Yeah, I've had Saratoga Springs. artists from Yado um, come over on. Um, Richard Saunders was, was Sanders, um, rather. Uh, he had... He has voiced um, what many people think, Violet Street is the best street in Saratoga Springs because yep. of its restaurants, because of the awesome mm -hmm. bookstore, lyrical ballads, um, patties. I mean, it's, it's just the whole street is legendary. And um, Cafe Lena, my God, is the centerpiece it of really the whole is. street. And so I am really fortunate to be there, never mind um, in the same building with Cafe Lena. 
No, SPAC too, though, also being located in that region. I mean, that's got to be, I mean, a, a real reason for you to be there. I would imagine so many bands have come through and probably needed your help in one way or another. Yes, um, you know, SPAC draws on uh, uh, the big time rock groups, of course, on um, Philadelphia Orchestra, um, New York City Ballet, and they're all great musicians, of course, that stumble on my shop from there. Um, they're all very appreciative of me being there. Sometimes they don't even have anything done. They just want to hang and know I'm there um, mm. and, and have some conversation. And that's fine, too. Well, I mean, a music store for musicians is a community. And, mm -hmm. you know, being based up there, I love it up there. Um, I try to stay away from the gambling that they have going on. Um, I remember... I was broadcasting in uh, Saratoga. We were at the track. I went to every single weekday race that there was uh, because I was on the air. We were broadcasting, but I never actually saw a race because we were out in the main public area. Uh, so I had an intern and I decided, you know, we should do a bet. So I bet $20, apparently $20. I didn't realize that was a decent bet. I would have won some good money if my horse came in. So I bet the second horse in the eighth race, which was the last race. I don't remember the name of the horse, but I bet him because I like the name, you know, kind of like a reason my wife would pick a horse. And um, lo and behold, my horse won. Except when I looked at my ticket, it said Belmont at the top. Uh oh, <laughs> why would they do that? That, that would be me. So, um, I mean, being in that area, do you, you live in that area as well? Nope. Um, we don't um, right now, but we lived in Saratoga for, for um, about four or five years. We had a condominium uh, two blocks away from, from the track, and that experience in itself is in the book, um, and it was just a you know, magical place to, to, to live, um, being so close to the track, and just the energy around it is, is, a, is phenomenal, so it was, it was real special. Absolutely. Now... I mean, so what would you say, like, I mean, what's your actual, like, title besides owner uh, of the shop and everything? I mean, obviously you do work technical and all that, but what would you describe what you actually do at the shop? I would think technician. Um, officially in the IRS's eyes, I'm president. I'm trying to get them to call me El Presidente, but they, <laughs> they won't do it. Um, so that, it's kind of, that's only really a business thing. I, I incorporate it for actual tax reasons and stuff, but you know, I'm the guy that works on the horns. Billy, my son, is the guy who works on the horns. That's what we do. Um, sometimes we sell an instrument. Um, sometimes we have to um, console our customers if they're heartbroken about their instrument. Right. You know, you know, so we're beautiful and social workers too, but um, we're technicians. We love to work on horns and that's what we do the, the best and what we love. A technician's also a musician? Um, no. Although I play every instrument I fix, um, I'm not a professional musician, never wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I was the guy in, in high school band who loved high school band, but right. I hated the concerts because I would get stage fright so bad that I would just fluff up everything. I would just, um, so uh, it, it was a very easy de decision to go to learn how to fix music instruments and right. not learn not to go to, you know, enhance my, my playing. When I was younger, I mean, I'm talking third grade, um, I really thought the saxophone was really cool. But the school didn't have any saxophones left, so they gave me a clarinet, which they basically thought was the same thing. And I don't know, man, just the reed on my tongue, <laughs> it wasn't for me. I couldn't, I couldn't do the horns, but I love them. Um, just, just really great. And that's ironic because some of the greatest sax players in the world David Sanborn, Nick Rignola, they all started out on clarinet hmm. and they got the sound down. And once you get the sound down on a clarinet, you can fly on a, um, on a saxophone. So I'm told by some of these great artists. So I gave up you know, too early. You gave up too early. I gave up too early. And every kid yeah. that comes into my shop that says, I have to play clarinet because they won't give me a saxophone. I'd say, ah, oh, that's, that's not... good. Okay. That's good. Learn the clarinet. You practice it every day really good at the clarinet then switch the saxophone mm. and then watch what they say so that's you not know. an uncommon thing it's not hmm. it's, you know 
I think this thing about saxophone is it, it, you know, it has that like sexy vibe to it. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, saxophone is, um, you know, something that we all strive to do. We all wish that we could do, but uh, clarinet, you know, it doesn't have the same respect, but if someone plays it right. Oh yeah. I mean, there's beautiful. Some great clarinet players. Evan Christopher out of New Orleans. Um, Nick Rignola played some of these classical guys that come in from the New York City Ballet and, um, and the Philadelphia Orchestra, they can rip it up with some jazz licks. I mean, they're good musicians, um, you know, that I'm just in awe of every time I listen to them. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I ended up doing a little guitar, you know, a little bit of everything except for horned instruments. It takes a lot out of you. It, it's a lot to have that kind of oxygen to really make it happen. Yeah. And, uh, but I know that you've had so many, I mean, obviously you wrote a book about it. You have so many experiences with so many, like just, uh, you know, legendary, legendary acts. I mean, what would you say? Like, obviously we don't want to give too much of the, the book away, but what would you, uh, what kind of stories would you tell? I mean, uh, verbally that, that you could tell about, you know, someone that you worked with. When I tell my stories verbally, I try to um, kind of see what the person wants to hear. Okay. If you grew up in, in the age of um, aqua lung, you're going to tell your gentle told stories. Um, if you're more of a classical guy or a girl, you know, talk about the Philadelphia Orchestra. Right. They're all, they're all stars. Oh yeah. And then you have your inspirational stories, people who are, or not of, of that cal at that caliber, but um, fantastic musicians, um, just the same for, for what they do and the music they put out and how dedicated they are. That, that to me is pretty awesome. Look at all these people who, who we had a pandemic for crying out loud. Did they stop playing? No, they played out of balconies and on Zoom and uh, across the street from each other. He's not gonna stop musicians. And, and I think that's a, that's a pretty powerful, wonderful thing. I mean, when I was, when I was a real little kid, they were filming a movie, Ironweed. Have you seen it? I've seen it. I went to, I actually went to the, um, the premiere in Albany. Oh, you did? Yes. Nice. Okay. So yeah, you've seen it. Well, it was so cool to me. I mean, I was 10 years old, if that, um, my grandfather was in it. He was actually one of the first people in it. He was in a few different parts. My cousin is the redheaded author boy walking behind Merrill Street. Can't miss him. Um, but I bring this up because meeting like people, there were so many scenes that were being filmed by where I live. I literally, as a little kid, talking well, at the time, the movie came out, I was 10 years old like eight or nine years old I'm walking out and here's Jack Nicholson like right outside of my house you know and I knew who he was um and just for him to like look at me and like point and like hey kid what's going on you know just such a good feeling that sticks with you I imagine as you know being in the business that you're in and all the people that you met there must have been some kind of like instance that really stuck out somebody that really made you feel good there's there's quite a few one one that really sticks out in my mind right now is hanging with the horn section um, of Ch Chicago backstage. Um, uh, my son, actually it was my son's birthday um, uh, back about four years ago. And um, we went backstage to work on Ray Herman's um, saxophone. And, and sure enough, the other, the other guys were there and just to hang oh. out with the horn section and, and just talk like we're talking now. There was, right. just, there was no big deal, no fanfare or no, you know, it, it just, and, and that would, it's just so special to um, just have a, a normal conversation with some of these people that, I mean, Chicago, I was, I was ready, I was going into college on that summer and me and Mary Alice were sitting on the lawn watching Chicago, that was 1975. And then, um, you know, fast forward 40 years later, we're sitting in the VIP seats and we kind of elbow each other, go, we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so that's how and SPAC is special to us too. We we'll always go on there, even when we were kids. So it's a it's a special place for sure. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I haven't been there in many years. Um, it's been a, a thing for me. I well, well, I'll take you. 
Okay. All right. Maybe when Dave Matthews comes through. I'm down with that. All right. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You're in, man. If, if I'm in, you're in. There's no telling what will happen, but we got to get you back to SPAC, man. That's the... Yeah, it's been a while. I haven't, you know, yeah. there's only so much time in the world that's back has so many great shows and uh god tom petty play there so much and i never got to see tom petty and that 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 kind of hurts i feel you're praying brother sorry well i imagine there's probably someone out there that you really you know looked up to never really got the chance to, to see live mm -hmm. well, clarence clemens i would have loved to see him live with um you know, bruce springsteen yeah uh, yeah, was, yeah, there's you know several people I would love, love to see. Yeah, so many, so many. I'm, I'm. Did you see how they're doing these hologram concerts? There hasn't been that many of them. It all started, um, I think it was Coachella a few years ago, and they're doing the show. It was actually Snoop Dogg uh, doing uh, his performance, and all of a sudden, Tupac walks out on stage. I mean, this is in the 2000s people uh he's been dead since i think 1996 and uh, i think about that kind of technology first of all the people there were probably freaked out going i told you he was alive but um imagine being able to see the beatles you know before they got crazy and then intermission and then when they got cool or you know young elvis intermission fat elvis <laughs> You know what I mean? But that would be so cool. You would be able to actually see those concerts. I don't know if they'd have the same feeling or not. I mean, truly, they couldn't possibly have the exact same feeling. No, I don't think so. But it's a dream. Yeah. It's just a dream I have. Um, so I've had my experiences with famous musicians. Most of them were really cool. Most of the time, too, I was surprised, even if a band is known to be like wild, their, their music is aggressive. Usually you're backstage and hanging out with them and it's pretty normal, kind of like this. There are exceptions to that rule. But I've also encountered musicians that were complete nightmares to deal with. Like you're there working for them and they're just not grateful. The ego thing is involved. I don't know if there's any of those in here, but you have to have a story like that. I, I really don't. If I worked on their horn, I, I have a reason to have, to have had some kind of rapport with them. So um, it's true. there are instances where I've um, walked up to a um, famous jazz musician or somebody handed them a card and then literally shoving it back in my face saying, I go to New York, man, or something. I won't mention any names, but so mm -hmm. yeah, of course there's been rejection and, and not everybody's gonna be nice. But I can truly say that every every musician that I've had a rapport were with and um, that generated a backstage um, experience was was always cool and you know great experience. Well, that's true. You are doing something for them. Um, most of the time, when I was doing something, it was like I had to try to get an interview, uh, be a photographer, that sort of thing. And how you said you wouldn't name names, me neither, but Everlast, uh, yeah, he had my camera taken away because Pringle sponsored an event. Yeah. <laughs> that was because, you know, so many people don't actually own the rights to their movie or their music. Well, Everlast, who was in uh, House Pain, does not own the rights to jump around, which is played probably at every single stadium, anytime a, a goal is scored or something like that. Uh, well, Pringles used it for a commercial. And uh, yeah, he was just like, Pringles is sponsoring this event. Take that guy's camera away. And I'm uh -oh. thinking like, why are you taking it out on me? <laughs> like, there's plenty of other people here that you can blame. Um, so, I mean, I, I see names in here, even like B.B. King and, you know, people like that. So you've, you've done some work for his band. No, um. B.B. King, I wrote because it, um, it, to see him was inspirational. Okay. I always wanted to see B.B. King. You talked about people you want to see mm. before it's too late. Um, I almost missed it because, um, you know, B.B. King had um, passed away soon after I, I saw him. Wow. Um, with me and Mary also saw The Grateful Dead months before Jerry Garcia passed away. I went, wow. You know, just. Close call. It, it, yeah, a close call. And uh, we're very, very lucky to have seen him in concert and the band it's a 
phenomenal mm. band. Absolutely. You know, so. Yeah, there's there's so many out there. I mean, so, I mean, I have in this particular job that I have in, in interviewing people and meeting people, you know, you got a few like, uh, what do they say, like the, uh, the golden cow or whatever, people that you'd really want to be able to interview or, or work with. Now, of course, my bucket list is complete because Bill Cole is here. Oh. But, you know, there still are a few out there that are on there. Anyone that you hope walks through your shop one day? Oh, boy. You know, I know that I could probably name off 10 people if, if, I, if I thought about it. I just can't think of anybody right, right now. Because they've you know, all been there. You know, this whole thing <laughs> has been serendipitous. And anyhow, um, who would think that, uh, you know, the lead singer of Chicago would wander in my shop and then call up the saxophonist and say, hey, do you know this shop exists? And then you go, it's all serendipity, really. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the fun of it. If yeah. I wish something and it, did, and it doesn't come true, it, it's, it's, it's just disappointing. So mm -hmm. I think I just let things happen. Um, it's, first of all, it's more fun. Um, I could probably finagle my way into, into a, a show or, a, or finagle my way into meeting somebody it's not as fun as if we stumble upon each other. Right. And, um, and I think that's what a lot of the stories are. Um, uh, Joe Donahue, uh, WMAC, mm -hmm. uh, W AMC. AMC. Um, interviewed me and he, he um, noticed that the book had a lot of serendipity in it. Yeah. And then, and I said, I could have named the book that. Um, right. That's the fun of it. That's the fun of it just being in tune to any opportunity that might come up and, and appreciating it, fighting the extraordinary and the ordinary, whether it's um, backstage um, experience or that young person that comes in for the first time and it's on fire to play the saxophone, sure. you help him out and all before you know it, he's playing all kinds of great um, uh, music in his band and, you know, and state run affairs and things like that. Uh, that's the fun of it. It really is. It's funny because uh, you mentioned or, you know, we kind of brought it up about people like, you know, you just run into my friend actually cooked dinner for Melissa Etheridge last night, which I just thought really? was like the coolest thing ever. You know, I hope he didn't screw it up. It was good. I hope so. He's, he's a master chef. I let him stay with me for a little while and uh, stuff's a little too spicy. So, I had to take a sip of my water here. Um, so, um, so we covered a lot of that, but there's gotta be like a certain chapter, something in here that really just holds near and dear to your heart. Well, I mean, cause well, the whole book kind of has that feel. I think, um, what is near and dear to my heart right now is the situ situation in Haiti. Um, yeah. many will know that I, um, I've done some, some work in Haiti training, um, young men and women how to repair instruments. That was their, just a one-shot deal that turned into several trips and, and um, several apprentices. Um, I have a, pro a couple of protégés down there that are doing great. And um, my heart goes out to them lately because of all the, yeah. the turmoil in, in Haiti, natural I mean, and yeah. natural. Absolutely. <clears throat> it is a dangerous place uh, to be. It really is. Um, so I, I know my protege um, from Las Cajobos was going to try to tune in tonight. And I, don't, I can't see who, who our guests are. But if Mayan is, is listening, uh, we'll say a, a shout out to Mayan. He can't always get on, um, get a connection. But he may not or may or may not be. Yeah, my son-in-law is from Haiti. And it's just, uh, you know, it's been really tragic there uh, lately. And uh, yeah, definitely. Got to give love out to Haiti and everything that they're going through and just wish that things would turn around there and streets just need to be safer for the, the people. I've seen some disturbing images lately. What brought you into to doing this for Haiti? And there's a lot of countries out there that certainly do need help, but what brought you into that? Serendipity once again. I mean, about 30, 35 years ago, I don't know the exact year, 
when I had my shop in Mortavalli, right on 19th Street, right across the river is St. John's um, Episcopal Church. They have a sister uh, church in Las Cajobos, um, mm. um, Santa Spree or Church of the Holy Spirit. And um, they would make several trips down. And with each trip, they would bring an instrument, you know, for their band. Right. And before they would fly down there, they would always bring it over to my shop and ask me to check it over. Never was anything involved. I just played it, made sure it was okay, made sure there was some reeds in there. The mouthpiece was clean, clean out the case a little bit, put a rubber stamp on it. You're good to go. Go ahead. And this would happen for about till 2016 when um, uh, Dawn Weinthrop, the, the coordinator for the program, came into my shop and she said, you know, those instruments that we sent down, they're all in disrepair. And I'm um, pretty, pretty sad that they're kind of like in a pile, um, unplayable. Yep. And I just kind of threw out there, I'll go down and fix them. And so, and she says, wow. would you? And so, and I went home and, you know, discussed it with Mary Alice. Of course, she was supportive. And, 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 um, and, and so it came to be the following spring, I, I went with St. John's uh, mission team. Hmm. And just for one time, I figured I'll fix as many answers as I could. I'll teach the teacher how to do um, just basic repairs and that'll be it. Right, you teach a man to fish. And yes, that's right, teaching mm-hmm. how to fish. Um, so on the way home on the airplane, I just said to myself, I have to go back. And that's where that thought, Horns for Haiti came into my head, wow. it just popped into my head. And I'll say, all right, I'll call it Horns for Haiti, I'll go back. Well, um, I eventually was able to incorporate Horns for Haiti. And I, and I, and that was, I got the approval from the IRS last in April of the pandemic. Wow. You know, so hmm. just when I thought it was all, all gone and lost, I got a letter from the IRS congratulating me. I was now a nonprofit. So that's how that all came about and lots of stories in between. I mean, first of all, I mean, that's commendable. Uh, that's, that's really cool that you've uh, done oh, that. You. Um, so you plan on going back down there, it sounds like? I will eventually when it when it's safer, and it, it has to be safe for me. It has to be safe for my drivers. Yeah. Um, you were always pretty much um, had safe passage if you were with a with a priest or the pastor of the church. But that has even changed now, so I have to make sure it's safe for everybody. But until then, we have Zoom. We're we're teaching online. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah. I I have an account set up with DHL um, where they give me. Uh, a, a very generous discount and i have um we have billy set of drums in court of prince right now waiting for the roads to oh wow be repaired so they can deliver it hmm. um so yeah so we're, it's an ongoing thing even though i can't be there we're we're still um communicating with the guys and girls and um they're still repairing instruments i'm still getting ads and park down there through dhl and uh, it's it's working and and it and you commend me. You commit. Yeah. These are the guys that are carrying it. They could say, okay, bye. Right. Thanks a lot. That was fun. That's true. Man, they won't stop. Yeah. Talk about musicians not stopping. They, they're, they're on fire and they're so proud. Well, like I said, my, my son-in-law is uh, from there. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely familiar with some of the great music that they, that they have coming out of there for sure. Yeah. I've never been, certainly would like to go. Uh, you know, if my schedule is free and you end up going back down there, at least let me know. Okay. Uh, cause, uh, it'd be pretty neat. It'll be a family affair. It'll bring my son-in-law, my, my daughter. Oh my God. She's pregnant. She's, uh, <laughs> do I look old enough to be a grandfather? Like, seriously, that's why I wear these shades, like in every interview, just so you can't see, you know, the lines underneath my mm-hmm. eyes. Um, but you're a grandfather five times over five mm-hmm. times over. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. They say that you treat the grandkids uh, a little bit better and differently and sneak them candy and give them money and all that stuff that you would never have done for your own kids. I don't know if it's true. I haven't experienced it yet. I don't know. I think I treat my grandkids just like I treat my, my own kids at that age. You know, I think it, you get a more honest relationship out of, out of it that way. Right. I don't, I don't, that's, that's my take on it. But uh, you got, I mean, obviously uh, your son's a musician. Um, I know your daughter too. She's very much into music. Um, so you got kind of like a musical family. Is that passing down? 
through the generations to the to the grandkids like when we talked about before like you know your great 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 grandkids are going to find this book and and read it um but have you kind of is the, is the family they're, into they're it all, they're all dabbling in instruments so they're still very young so we'll, we'll see how that all all turns out but um of course you know pop pop will will have an instrument for them when they're whenever they're ready now i i tried to teach my children how to play the guitar i bought every single one of my kids at least the ones i know about i bought them all a guitar and tuning it i decided it was always going to be the first lesson they all wanted to be rock stars and they never wanted to learn how to tune it so mm -hmm. that's pretty much how that went my son uh the other day uh, my son is actually a paratrooper uh, in the army who thank god he was on standby to go to afghanistan do that whole thing um because he's in the uh, 82nd airborne but he sent me a song i didn't even know he was doing music and he sent me a song that he was doing i was like wow that's there pretty you cool you know not really my kind of style but it's cool to see you know it's never really going to be the style right our, our parents thought our music was evil that's it and you know it's just the way it goes but um <laughs> I don't know, as far as like, because of, you know, transcending down to, you know, your children and grandchildren, but what about you and like your parents and grandparents, were they also involved in music or was this something that just kind of happened with you? It just happened with me. Like, I don't know if any of my, my relatives or ancestors who, who played music to tell you the truth. Um, when I was first in business, I, I was, remember, I was 19 years old and and I started to get somewhat of a reputation and people would come in and say, um, and I would say, can I help you? And he goes, oh, your father here. And I would say, no, he's, he's not here. Can I help you with something? He goes, well, I need my instrument fixed. Well, I says, well, I'm the one who's fixing it. I'm barely shaving. And they're saying, I don't know if I want you working on my instrument, kid. You know? Yeah. So, and so I would get that quite often. And mm. finally, I developed a line. They say, is your father here? And I know he's like, well, you're awful young. I'd say, well, I used to be old, but I got out of it. Man. It was the aches and pains. I lost my hair, you know, you know, so, but, you know, it's ages and everything, I guess. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, I guess now 50 is the new 35. So as young as you feel. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but no, I, I've always really tried to instill the music into my kids and really I tried to show them like my music, you know, the good stuff, but they just don't really seem to latch on to it's gotta it. It's got to happen naturally. That's it does. why it just it really has does. to happen on their, their own terms. And um, just like my children, I would introduce every single one of them to the bench. Um, as it turns out, they, you know, Billy was, was the one who, who rose to the top as far as the, being a technician goes. Mm. But the girls had um, a good time just, you know, trying it out. And enjoy the experience, I'm sure, but um, you can't force that kind of You really can't. No, it's no, not at all. Truth. It does. It does. See, me, I was definitely in a, a family that was musically inclined. I mean, my mom wrote music. Uh, my dad, my dad loved doing the light show for Blue Oyster Cult. Um, mm -hmm. And back in the day, he actually design like this keyboard because he's kind of like an electrician without the degree and he he took a keyboard he wanted to feel like he was playing with blue oyster cult so the keys were the lights uh which was pretty cool i don't know if anyone actually has a light system like that that exists but you know just a cool feeling because you know he didn't really play much as far as uh, uh musical instruments my uncle was actually well he was the original blue oyster cult singer but before they were Blue Oyster Cult, before they were Soft White Underbelly, they actually had the coolest name, which was Travesty. I don't know why they switched to these names that weren't as good, but um, so much easier to chant. Uh, when you pick a band name, make sure that you know how to chant it. <laughs> good advice. Uh, but no, it sounds like you really had a, a supportive family and the wife as well is really important to be supportive uh, when you're in the music industry and, and working in it. That I can say for sure. And mm -hmm. like uh, it says, I mean, right here in the beginning of the book, for my wife, Mary Alice. Yep. She's so. my girl. Absolutely.
So we've got some great audience questions here. Is it okay if I jump in and ask a couple of those? Okay. Um, so Fiona wanted to know, what are some of the craziest things that you found inside instruments that you were repairing? Hello, Fiona. Um, well, the one that takes the cake is, is the time I took a gerbil out of a baritone horn. Um, it was really one of my first customers I was repairing out of my father father my father's garage and um and the doorbell rang and so I ran up to the doorbell and here's these two little kids shivering in the cold it's like October no coat on they got a baritone horn and I said can I help you are you the man who fixes instruments yes come on in what, what do you need can you take this den out for us please um I said why do you want that one den out and he said, well, it's riddled with dents so that's the, that's the dent that's holding our gerbil. Feel it, it's warm. And so you feel in that cold October day, you could feel that spot was warm. So that was the most strangest thing I had to take it out and, um, and had to be taken out delicately because you didn't want to hurt it, harm it at all. And so I blew it out with an air gun. And that's one of my favorite stories. And, it, and it, I spell that story right out for you. So that, that's a fun one. Other things were whoopee whistles and, you know, wall bearings and lunches out of sousaphone bells, you know, kids, you know, playing basketball, throwing things in the sousaphone bell, you know, so yeah, kind of a bunch of stuff I've taken out of instruments, I'm sure. That's fantastic. Um, Larry asks, can you still hear the music from Cafe Lena when the musicians rehearse there? I can, you know, um, they threw me out for six months to, so they could, um, renovate the building back a few years ago. And one of the saddest things that happened is they insulated my ceiling. So I was so sad, I said, I'm not gonna be able to hear the music anymore. But this wonderful thing happened, they took down the wall underneath the staircase. So now this, uh, if you've ever been to Cafe Lima, the stage kind of hits the staircase and there's no insulation underneath the stairs. So um, now I have this big, this little cavern, if you will, where my bench is. And when that music hits the staircase, it acts like a little resonator box. And so when musicians are warming up for, for that evening's performance, the radio goes off and me and Billy, um, you know, we'll look at each other, turn the radio off, turn, they're, they're, they're starting to play. And so, yes, I can hear it and it's wonderful. And I've been actually known to um, work late and maybe have a glass of wine or, you know. That's fantastic. I, I love the image of you there repairing an instrument and, and getting your own private show like that. Um, I got a. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Worst place in the world to have a, a band instrument repair show. It is. It is perfect. Um, I got a question anonymously in my direct messages, um, asking, "What is the future of Coles Woodwind Shop?" I can't stop. You know, my my shoulders are blown out. My my fingers are starting to get arthritic. So I can um, I can live through my son as he develops his skills further. Um, um, I will repair as long as I can. But in, in the meantime, um, I love to teach. Um, I'll, I'll be teaching up at Tai Kong Rogan in, in the next, within the next couple of weeks on so, some, to some of the North Country uh, music teachers. Um, I love to teach in Haiti. Now I can't travel to Haiti. I love to Zoom with them and interact with them and see what, what they're doing. And, uh, trying to guide them through some difficult repairs. Um, so, so the answer to your question is maybe I'll teach more. If I, you know, fix them as I can and teach more and, and pass that, that knowledge on to the, to the next generation. That's wonderful. That actually brings up a question that I had that I've wondered actually all day as I've been talking to you. Um, what was your training like? How, where and how did you learn to do the things that you do? Again, serendipity, you know, is I went from not knowing what I was going to do in my future. I mean, there was a good chance I was going to be a carpenter because I, I love carpentry. I still do. Um, but weeks before graduation, my music teacher sent me into the guidance office to figure out what college I would go to because you need to go to college for music. You love music. You have to find something. So she really encouraged me. And when I found that uh, brochure from uh, Morrisville College, um, part of the SUNY program um, system rather um, I knew that was it 
uh, I called uh, the coordinator. He, t he told me that um, I was too late to apply, but somebody had just backed out of the program, uh, couldn't do it. And so he's, that was my end. Perfect timing, meant to be. And with my um, then girlfriend, Mary Alice, was encouraging me to go, uh, do it. Go out and do it, she said. You want to do it, do it. Nobody told me that. No grown up told me that. A 15 year old told me that. And I did it. I got in my car, didn't skip school the next day, um, <laughs> interviewed. He said, Well, first of all, I got to tell your parents, um, you, have, you have to get financial aid. You have to find a place to live. I'll do it. I'll do it. And, uh, and that's how that all be, uh, came to be. Um, it took me two years. Um, to earn a degree in band instrument repair or music instrument technology was the, the actual name of the degree. And then when I got out, nobody would hire me. So I started on my own shop temporarily. And <laughs> so if anybody's, you know, hiring, just let me, I'm still, still having a good job. <laughs> That's very cool. Does that program still exist? If, if you met a young person now who was looking to go into music musical instrument repair, could they go there? Unfortunately, no. Um, it lasted about 10 years and um, they folded the program and all the tools went up to Crane School of Music where um, the band repairmen at Crane School of Music, you know, would use. But yeah. there, I think there are some programs around the country that still have it, but they're awful expensive. Probably the best way to learn anyhow is, is to apprentice with somebody. Somebody will take you in, um, just be their apprentice, their intern, and just see if you like it, first of all, and, and just go from there, see what, how it develops. Have you had any apprentices ever other than your children? I've probably had, not counting the, the Haitians, I mean, I've probably had 20 apprentices over the course of the, course of the years. Um, and they've all gone on to promising careers. One is a film producer in New York City. One works on uh, an oil rig in Texas. Um, yeah, they, you know, it doesn't always happen where they're going to go on and be a repairman, although some have, of course. That, in its own way, is a real legacy, just like the book, a thing that, you know, is your work going forward generations into the future possibly that's really lovely to to think about it is it is and thanks for noticing yep so audience if you have other questions for billy you can type them into the chat um i'm happy to ask them for you we've got just a couple more minutes we're running low on time but we do have time for a couple more if you've got them um though i could also talk to billy all night long he's he's uh got a lot of great stories um billy i wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the fun interactions you've had with local kids coming into your shop. Oh, kids are great. Um, parents will come in and they'll say, my, my son or daughter wants to play an instrument and, and maybe they're a little too young. Um, so I just encourage them to get a teacher, okay? So that teacher can maybe start them out and record it before they go into the clarinet because there's ways to do it. You, if, if a young person is on fire to, to play, you, you should Suzuki piano, anything, anything to 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 fill that uh, their musical wants and needs. It, it's great. Um, but I rent some instruments. I don't do a lot of rental instruments because I'm not a big music store. I'm just a small pro shop. I only rent instruments uh, because um, because there's a need. If somebody comes in and wants to rent an instrument, I don't want to send them away. I want to be able to help them out. And most kids are like, yeah, I'm going to play the clarinet, I'm going to play the trumpet, whatever, you know. But you see some of them we were the wide eyes, and he opened up the flute case, and the girl looks like, or the boy looks like the flute. And, and they're, I always say, all right, when you play Carnegie Hall, I want a front row seat. You understand? I'm serious. I'm serious, you know. And, um, you know, and I have, and I've had people who, who've grown up and, you know, touring with, touring with big bands now that they, you know, it, it, anything is possible. So you have to encourage and flame that spark. That's wonderful that, again, it's a legacy. It's a legacy going forward where, you know, there's these kids who started out in front of you and are out in the world now. Yes. 
So I would I we don't have a lot of time left, but I would love to ask very quickly about the process of writing this book. It's a, obviously a departure for you. It's a new, different thing. Um, was there anything that surprised you about the process of writing the book, and anything that you found particularly enjoyable about it? Well, um, it, it first of all, it took me twenty years to write it, and I kept on rewriting and rewriting it. And whenever I asked a, 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 an established author give me some advice. They mostly said the same thing, write for yourself. And I, I didn't know if, if there's a way for them to just, you know, scoot me along or whatever, but um, they were right. I needed to write for myself. I needed to read that paragraph and go, no, 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 that, that needs to be written a little better. And then when, when I got it right, I said, oh, that's it, that's it. So I wrote for myself and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a lot of hard work. Um, I, I've got a new respect for established, you know, true authors and true writers. Um, I say that at the beginning. I'm I'm not a writer, but just just long enough to tell my story. Please, uh, please indulge me. Um, so, so I don't think anything surprised me. I knew it was going to be hard. Everybody told me it was going to be hard, and they were right. It, it, it's hard. You can't just write a book and put it out there, uh, even when it was done. Uh, and drum edited for me, and and something happened within the, uh, in the in the publishing of it, where an old transcript was was interjected or something like that, and it came out with a ton of mistakes. And I was mortified for Ken because um, it was um it wasn't right. He spent so much time on it, so we we since corrected most of it, but there's still a couple little bloopers in there. But I'm gonna be an instrument repair man. I I think now you have a book out. You count as a real writer. It's it's. There's, oh. that's the only, honestly, if you write, you're a real writer. So don't, don't sell yourself short. Um, we are just about out of, out of time, but one last question is, will there be another book? Is there another book in your future? I have enough for a new book right now, but you know, it's, it's gonna need to be worked and reworked. Um, I have new stories every day. Um, and so there will be enough for a new book. I don't know if it, it'll be published. I would like to publish it someday. I think I, I would go about it a little differently. I'd, um, you know, take it a little more seriously, maybe. Um, not that I did this time, but you know, do a few things differently. So yeah, someday I think there will be a, um, an, another book. Fantastic, that's a great thing to look forward to. Well, Billy and Rob, thank you both so much for taking the time to join us tonight and talk with us. Um, great questions, great conversation, a real pleasure they hear from you both. Audience, thank you so much for being here. You can order with the band at northshire.com. I dropped the link to that in the chat a couple of times, and it was also in your ticket confirmation email. Um, and you can also visit us at northshire.com to hear about other great events that we have coming up. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, Northshire, as well. You're the greatest. Thank you, Billy. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye.